Please welcome to the stage, Diane Williams and Dr. Jen Doliak. I'm Diane Williams and with me is Dr. Jennifer Doliak. Jen is a, an associate professor of economics at Texas A&M. And I think it's important that we note that she's uh, in the field of economics. She also, however, takes a look at crime and other areas. And so our focus today, of course, is reducing recidivism. So we're calling on her crime work. Jen, one of the articles that you wrote indicates that wraparound services don't support successful reentry. We've heard today lots of people who said just the opposite. <laughs> we talk, people talked about looking at needs and me, needing to do a better job at addressing those needs. Mm -hmm. People talked about evidence-based programming and all kinds of other things. Help us to understand what you learned and why you think that. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so first I want to sort of apologize for being an economist. Economists tend to bring the bad news to any policy conversation, and I think that's my role here today as well. Um, but, uh, but really what we're focused on is uh, distinguishing correlation from causation. Um, and so, so I've basically spent the last couple of years getting, uh, gathering every empirical study I could find related to kind of what works uh, in terms of improving uh, reentry outcomes coming out of prison and jails. Um, and reducing recidivism and synthesizing all of those studies and trying to wrap my, my head around what, you know, what, what we know. Um, and it is sort of remarkable how little we know, partly because the data are, are so spotty. Um, but one of the, the um, more striking conclusions, I think, of that review was that the best evidence that we have around these, what I think is a very hot uh, program right now, wraparound services or more holistic um, types of programs that uh, I think are, are, have great potential because they do acknowledge the many needs that people coming out of jail and prison typically have. Um, is this not working? Okay, this is, oh, hey, it's, oh, I was on your mic. Is that what was picking up? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Um, so, yeah, so the best evidence on these wraparound service programs and holistic uh, um, programs suggests that they either have no impact on the participants or that they are actively detrimental in the sense that the people who are in the treatment group actually wind up being convicted or incarcerated at higher rates going forward than the people in the control group. And so, you know, I have a lot of, conversations with people who believe very strongly in these kinds of programs and uh, who uh, you know, think that these, these findings just can't possibly be true and maybe it's something about the implementation of the programs, maybe they just weren't implemented well enough, which is surely possible, um, but you know, these were typically programs that the people thought of as the gold standard and highly respected. And so the, my takeaway from that, that body of research is really that uh, we should not take for, we should, sort of assume that, um, uh, that, you know, put this in the category of programs where um, we should be continuing to experiment and iterate um, and definitely should not be taking for granted that those kinds of programs are having benefits. So of course, as a person who worked in those programs for a lot of years, I, my, first, my first inclination was to call all of my research friends up and shoot holes in the research that you referenced. My second thought was to bring pictures of all the successful people and just roll them through the entire day mm -hmm. to, to prove that some of those kinds of things do in fact work. But, but I understand the distinction between sort of what I sense and feel and see and what gets measured. Mm -hmm. When I was at SAFER, we spent a lot of time talking about getting the right service at the right level to the right person in the right place and at the right time. Mm -hmm. To what extent do you think the research you looked at, looked at addresses those things? Yeah, it's a great question. I think there's, um, you know, that's certainly what these programs are designed to do. Uh, you know, you have a case manager or some, someone who can kind of do a needs assessment and figure out exactly what you need and get you all the help that you need. Um, uh, it's possible that the programs weren't working because they didn't do a good enough job of doing that. Um, it's also possible that, you know, doing all of those things and holding someone's hand through all of these different aspects of their lives and requiring all these different meetings actually was detrimental in some way that, um, that uh, is more relevant to sort of the fundamental concept of the model. Like maybe it just isn't, isn't going to work on average. Of course, there's also a question of, you know, they're going to be different programs. They're going to work for different types of people. And this is also just something that we don't have a good understanding of yet. Yeah. I, I guess what I'm really wondering as well, though, is do you think that the programs themselves did a good job of identifying the needs of individuals? Mm -hmm. Or were those programs structured on, if you will, groupings of people? So the people were categorized in certain ways and a certain set of services were provided, and you know, whether we use the term dose or a certain amount of those services were provided. Mm -hmm. I think about the timing 
of when those services are provided. Were people giving, given services in the order in which they needed them? Yeah. So the people, were, were people operating on the employment first program or mm -hmm. were, they, were their addictions treated first and their housing needs met and those kinds of things? Yeah. I yeah. have no idea. <laughs> um, yeah, no, this is, I think, uh, as someone who now spends some time studying reentry myself, I think I, you know, I think this is one of those open questions about what is the order that we should be we should be trying to meet these needs in. Is it something where we could conceivably meet all the needs at once, or is employment most important, or housing most important, or health most important? Um, and uh, this is something we just don't have a good understanding of. I mean, so, so it's interesting because. Even when you frame it that way, I mm -hmm. would also still say that's probably each answer would be different for a different person. Mm -hmm. And I Surely. think that's, yep. the, that's the, the, something that concerns me mm -hmm. sort of consistently when we think about research. One of the things that you mentioned was that the research outcomes for smaller programs tended to be better than those for larger programs. Um, I don't remember that. And I, I, think, <laughs> I, I think I recall it in terms of, you, I think you made a comment about um, maybe because they were smaller, the, the evaluation itself could be clearer or could focus more specifically on different aspects of it. Um, I, I don't remember which one of your articles it was in because I read several of them. <laughs> but, but I have heard that in other places. Uh -huh. What are your thoughts about smaller versus larger program evaluations? Um, I think, well, I mean, I, I think that uh, there is certainly an interesting question about you know, to what extent one can scale these kinds of, pro or any program up into being, um, into being uh, successful at a larger scale. Um, this is definitely not my primary area of expertise, so <laughs> I don't have a whole lot to say about it. And, and I ask that because I think over the years, a number of different program, or researchers have looked at that, and it seems to me that smaller programs or programs that have sort of a better ratio, that have sort of a, more, uh, a better opportunity for staff to connect mm -hmm. to the individual that's, that's receiving those services often do generate um, really good results. Have you at all looked at that part of it? So this is related to kind of another area that, that I've looked at is um, intensive supervision. Yes. So another thing that definitely does not work, um, and the research on this is very clear at this point, is that um, increasing the intensity of, or having in what we would generally call intensive supervision in, in the community, so in, uh, intensive probation or, or um, parole, uh, does not come, does not achieve any public safety benefits, it doesn't reduce recidivism, it does help people rack up technical violations that can get them thrown back into prison. Um, and so what we don't know is what the right level of supervision is, but what we currently term intensive supervision is too high for everyone, basically. Um, so there, and there I think that that is related in the sense that often what facilitates the more intensive supervision is having a lower ratio of um, supervisees to probation or parole officers. So if you have su fewer people to keep track of, then you require more meetings and, and, uh, and stuff from each of those people. And that does not seem to be helpful. So, so I think you also in that section said something about um, the person that, is, that was being intensively supervised mm -hmm. um, might really interpret that as an intrusion of sorts um, and respond negatively and that maybe it's not necessarily even the program in that case that's mm -hmm. the issue. It's the, the feeling or the sense that that particular participant gets. Do you think feelings play a role in all of this stuff? Sure, yeah. <laughs> I think that, you know, the, the um, ways in which that people, you know, see or feel like the government is, is uh, interacting with them or how our policies and programs make them, make them feel and, and as, you know, whether they're valued citizens or not um, is certainly something that, that would be a potential mechanism for any of these results. And, and again, it relates back to things that we heard earlier today. It relates back to language that, that, that's used. It relates back to how people are treated, whether they are, there's a respectful relationship there, whether there's an informed staff person that knows how to effectively interact with the people sitting across the table and all of those other kinds of things would be my take mm -hmm. on some of those, on some of that. You also took a look at employment specifically. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think you kind of said, not your language, but mine, that said employment didn't pay off. Um, and so talk, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, this is really interesting. So certainly my prior as an economist is that jobs and employment are going to be like the key to solving this problem and, and reducing recidivism rates. And so um, it's certainly been a focus of our policy in this area. I think there are two big areas or big, big things that we've tried related to employment that, that haven't worked um, the way that we'd hoped. One is transitional jobs programs. Um, there's this idea that, you know, if we 
wish everyone coming out of prison could have a job, maybe we should just give them jobs um, and, and, and you know, see what the outcomes are. And it turns out people will show up for those jobs, um, typically in you know, nonprofit for something like, basically a guaranteed full-time job for um, about six months. Um, but after that six month period, the, uh, their employment rates in the private sector go right back down to where the control group is. There's no long term effect on employment outcomes. Um, there's also very little, if any, effect on recidivism during that entire period. Um, and so those transitional jobs programs don't seem to be having the impacts that we want. Um, the other, the other big policy that we've tried is ban the box. Um, at this point, the, there's a, a rapidly growing literature um, that's, again, pretty conclusive at this point that um, ban the box does not increase employment for people with criminal records, and it actually makes it harder for young men of color who don't have records to get jobs. So there's this really important unintended consequence that uh, we should care about, even if it's you know not the, the, the main target population that, um, that a lot of people in this room are focused on. And so, uh, you know, when we think about this broader question of how to increase employment for people coming out of our jails and prisons, I think it's still an important question and we, we don't know how to do it yet, but it's also possible that the job is actually not kind of the key driver of, of criminal behavior or recidivism that we all thought it was. There's more evidence that things like financial assistance actually have a much bigger impact than giving someone a job does. Um, things like cognitive behavioral therapy have been pr proven at this point in a variety of settings to work. Um, my hunch is it's going to be stuff like increasing access to mental health care and substance abuse treatment that's going to be really effective, although there it's, re again, remarkable how little we know about what kinds of programs work. But so I think this is a place where we just need to be experimenting like crazy, um, and it's helpful that a lot of this policy happens at the state and local level. There's a lot of experimentation going on out there, but we need to be experimenting and we need to be evaluating because it's... And we should be assuming that everything we try, frankly, will fail because this is really hard. And, uh, and we've been, you know, a lot of people have been working on these issues for a very long time and we haven't fixed them yet. We haven't solved everything yet and that's because they're difficult to solve. And so our goal should be to fail fast rather than not fail at all. I, I, love, I love that concept. <laughs> I, I think that, and I'm encouraged because in spite of the fact that you read all of that negative literature, <laughs> I'm thankful, first of all, that you're not like the Canadian Martin who was so depressed after having done the same thing that he killed himself. That was a pretty is, scary point in time, but it did yes. launch people like John Drew and those others to start looking at what works. And so I kind of hear you sort of leaning in that direction as well, which is to say, so maybe what we need to do is think about a different way of experimenting or a yeah. different look at it. I, I, I've heard a couple of times today the concept about the black box, mm -hmm. where everything gets thrown into the box and it's very difficult at that point to determine component by component what is working or what isn't mm -hmm. working, or what, if you will, or what mixes of those are com components are working and for whom. Mm -hmm. um, so, so where would you take the research next? Yeah, great question. Yeah, I mean, so those, the figuring out the answers to those kinds of questions of figuring out, you know, which kinds of programs work for which people and, and all of that really is, you know, several layers of research away from, from where we are now. We're still trying to figure out broad categories, like should we give people jobs or should we give people money or should we give people health care or what is it? Um, and so, so we will get there, but we're just nowhere near, near that point yet. Um, I think that, um, you know, the main, in, in my mind, it, there, I guess I care less about the specific types of things being tried um, and, and care, I care a lot about just like trying a huge variety of things and doing it and implementing things in a way that allows us to evaluate whether it works. Because um, I'm sure, you know, it, the, it's amazing to see the huge variety of people in this room today coming at this issue um, with tons of experience from very different backgrounds and you all are going to have uh, in many ways much better ideas than I do about what the things are that could work on the ground in your communities or in the space that you work in um, and so it's it's I think we're, we're still at a place where we really don't even have a clear answer that it's going to be in the health category or it's going to be employment um, I think everything's kind of up for grabs so have you looked at any programs? So you looked at wraparound services and research that was already done. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, we compare them from a control group and a treatment group. What about people compared to people who aren't involved in either of those? People who just on their own come out of the institutions or get placed on probation or parole and fend for themselves. Do we have a sense of what happens with those people? So, so that tends to be the control group. Um, so usually you'll well, have so you'll have people who kind of um, are are deemed eligible for a study, and then they'll be 
uh, some of them will be assigned to the control group, which gets like basically status quo services. So whatever, if you're just, if in that community you just are released and you don't get anything, then that's what you're gonna get. Are you saying what would happen if we even took away current services? Yeah, I, so, so actually that's, that's really what I was looking at. Mm -hmm. and, and so forgive me for not languaging that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. No, that's interesting. Yeah, no, that would be really neat to try, especially given the result, the, the evidence that, you know, more supervision often seems to be counterproductive. I do often wonder like, you know, there are probably a lot of people who would be just fine if they just like walked out the door and no one, you know, came and found them again. Um, and, and there are gonna be other people who need some support and services. Um, and figuring out who those people are uh, and giving folks, you know, what they need. If they need assistance and, and support, then that's great. But I think there are probably a lot of people who don't. Um, there's a really interesting study out of Texas looking at uh, deferred adjudications. Um, so basically this is the, the idea that if you are uh, charged with, in this case, a, a felony, a low-level felony um, offense, uh, you um, would be placed on probation, and if you successfully completed the probation, that felony would not go in your record. You basically, it was um, as if it never happened. And, uh, and the researchers found that when it was the first felony, when this program helped you avoid the first felony on your record, you had dramatically better outcomes. So basically, like, you know, you, you had to serve some time on probation, but uh, if you got this chance um, to prove yourself, um, and, uh, and then they could look at what happened to your employment outcomes and recidivism down the road. And people who just like avoided getting that first felony conviction on their record did dramatically better down the road. And I think this really speaks to, um, you know, sometimes you don't, it isn't necessarily needing more support or whatever. It's, you know, avoiding getting the criminal record to begin with. Um, there are you know, other studies and examples I could talk about where we just like put the right incentives in place uh, and that can be really helpful. But I think, um, I think the current policy conversation is really focused on uh, you know, meeting, identifying needs and meeting needs. And I think sometimes we don't need to do all that stuff. So I just want to go back to employment for just a second. So a lot of effort and a lot of money now has been invested in helping people to get technical skills so that in fact they can get certifications um, that allow them to earn a higher wage. Mm -hmm. I sat in a room with a bunch of employers once and, and one, one gentleman who said he had never hired anybody with a criminal record before indicated though that the fact that we were now helping them to get the certificates from the right certifying agency, mm -hmm. from his perspective, his language, trumped having a, a criminal record. And so I'm wondering if you have had an opportunity to look at any of that. Yeah, so my sense is we don't really have any good evidence on the impacts of like vocational training or education programs in prisons or anything like that. Um, it's you know, the evidence we have is people who have like selected into, you know, they completed a GED while they're in, in prison and you look at people, compare them to people who didn't and people who completed the GED do better, but maybe that's just because they're motivated or something like that. Um, I think there is something to this idea that, you know, I think there are a lot of employers out there who, especially for kind of entry level um, uh, jobs that uh, would be the kinds of jobs that a lot of these folks would, would um, be trying to get, they're desperate to find people who would be great employees and show up every day and be reliable, right? And if we could figure out some way to help them identify those people who, yes, they have a criminal record, but like they, Otherwise, they'd be perfectly work ready and be great employees. Like, help them, help them find those people in the broader potential labor pool. You know, our economy will work better. It's like just a much more efficient outcome. Everyone's happy, right? And so, whether it's through a vocational training program, whether it's through some sort of just um, general reentry program, where you know that that is. Uh, because of the rules in place, like it, it, local employers know that anyone coming out of that program is a, is a great bet. Um, finding creative ways like that to kind of play a matching role, play matchmaker between the employers um, and, and the folks who want jobs, I think could be really useful. And the good news is there, there are a lot of agencies out there doing exactly that. Mm -hmm. So we yeah. have less than a minute, almost no time <laughs> at all. I mean, I guess what I get out of our conversation, Jen, is that we have a lot of work yet to do. Mm -hmm. that in fact there probably is more good work going on out there than we understand because we have not looked at it in the right way to determine the outcomes all the way through, if you will. Yeah. We've not looked at it at the individual level. Sometimes we forget about the context of the individual um, and try to make determinations and decisions from that perspective. So it just sounds like to me we still have quite a bit of research to work to do to determine what works. 
Yeah, we do it. We have a lot of work to do. I do think it's an exciting time, certainly as a researcher. It's, yeah, I feel like there's so much more data becoming available. There's so much policy experimentation happening. There is an amazing amount of really high quality research coming out in this space. Um, I actually have a podcast now on, on research on, on criminal justice called Probable Causation, if anyone's interested in keeping up with this. And part of my goal there is just to try to like broadcast the good work that is happening. Um, and yeah, so I think the, you know, the more, uh, also put in a plug for just collaborations between policymakers and practitioners and academics to, to help us all iterate faster and, and get to the solutions faster, because I, I believe that they're out there. That's, that's the, hopeful, the hopeful side of this. I think that we'll find answers, um, and I just want to do that as quickly as possible. Thank you. I appreciate it. We'll both be around and happy to answer questions later. Thank you.